God damn it, why does the foam always fall over every time I open this goddamn door? The door's not even on its hinges. God damn it. Ugh. All right, set the water down. Phone, good. All right, here we go. There we go. Perks of having a modular fucking closet. Okay. Mic check. Okay, so I'm gonna be honest. I did a take of this previously. It did not turn out well. I just, I was tumbling over my words and like I was not reading things properly and I got like 20 minutes into this read and I was just like, I don't want to do this. And it just takes me back to um, when I was working freelance and I was reading scripts that I didn't write that then I had to go and clean up and edit and send to people and they would send me money at the end of the month. And I just was brought back to that moment and I was just like, I really, really am not having a good time right now. So instead what I'm going to do is I'm going to do it again, but I'm going to try to take it a little less seriously. I'm going to try to be a little less This American Life and more just make it sound like what I'm reading is off the cuff, but in reality, you know, if I, if I make a mistake, we'll leave it in unless it's just f***ing terrible, and in then that case, we'll, we'll roll with it. It's important to, um, make it clear that when talking about things I like, you know, it's okay to stumble over my words, and in a, in a video essay, retrospective, analysis thing, whatever, such as this, it's important to just, you know, Set the expectations a little lower, just, you know, this is, this is a fun thing. I'm doing this for fun, of my own accord, and I'm not trying to make this my day job. I'm just simply trying to talk about why I like Metroid Dread, okay? That's, that's really all it boils down to, because, you know, when I saw the trailer for the first time at that E3, like, I erupted from my chair and jumped around the room in, like, childlike ecstasy. The rest of the trailer was really interesting and, you know, really terrifying. <laughs> I was just watching it like Samus Aran was just like fighting a menacingly robotic stalking murder machine. And like, what do you do when you see that? After playing Metroid Fusion, like, you know the antagonists of Metroid Fusion at this point. It's been 19 years for heck's sake. And like, you know, if, if the events from Fusion are anything to go by, then, you know, these haha <laughs> dread-inducing moments were sure to be stressful, and you know what? I was really looking forward to that. My inner child was, like, exploding with glee, and knowing that the release date was only a few months later in October, watching the trailer in June, was just simply euphoric. You know, after 19 years, we were finally getting a sequel to one of my favorite games ever, Metroid Fusion. And, you know, I grew up with a Game Boy Advance, but I didn't actually get Metroid Fusion until it came to the Ambassador program on the 3DS. And, you know, that was my first experience with it. I think when that program came out, I was like 13 years old. Yeah, it was weird. I was trying to convince my parents to buy Ocarina of Time 3D and then like lie to them and be like, Oh no, I don't have the console I can play this on. Please, can we buy it for me? And uh, that did not work. <laughs> But nonetheless, um, nonetheless, I did end up playing through Metroid Fusion. For those of you who don't know, Metroid Fusion is the fourth main series entry in the Metroid franchise and was released in 2002. I was four. You do the math. Uh, and it came out on the Game Boy Advance. And the plot takes place after Super Metroid and after Samus has come back uh, Samus returns back to SR388, um, where the second game took place, Metroid 2 Return of Samus. And in that game, Samus goes and commits genocide and kills all of the Metroids on that planet, so that space pirates can't, in fact, take the Metroids for themselves. Um, but, you know, what happens when you remove an entire species from an ecosystem? It gets all thrown out of whack, you know? And, uh... You know, props to Nintendo uh, for taking that into consideration with this fourth game, because 
Her genocide of the Metroids on the planet has allowed the Metroids' prey, the X-Parasite, to overpopulate the planet and attack any living, breathing creature. Now, the X-Parasite, you know, itself is just sort of this little bright-colored blob-like thing that sort of whimsically floats around and uh, finds its next prey. Like, I think it has to be a breathing organism because you never see X pretending to be plants. It's really weird. I, I really don't get it. But when the X-Parasite takes control of these creatures, uh, it sort of acts very similar to John Carpenter's The Thing, you know, the monster in that, where, like, someone's face might split open sideways, or, um, you know, their chest might open up and tongues might come out or whatever, or, like, their face has petals now that open up and reveal this monstrosity. Um, you know, as, as, an, as, a, as a horror genre fan, to an extent, uh, this body horror is, like, just the right amount of ugh for me. Uh, any more, and it's like, oh, I don't need to see that. Because, like, you know, it's it's different. It's not like it's Saw. Um, but I digress. It's not it's not torture porn, is what I'm trying to say. Um, but anyway, I digress. Um, with Samus, she gets infected by these X-Parasites, but, um, and so does her crew. But she's quickly rushed back to, like, a medical station where she's injected with a source of Metroid DNA. Um, which sort of miraculously quickly acts and allows Samus to absorb the X-Parasite now. Um, which is really cool. Um, and it heals her. Can you believe that? It heals her. Um, and this, in a way, makes Samus herself a bit of a Metroid. Um, it's kind of interesting, kind of different. <laughs> After all these things, you know, Samus is like part Chozo, part Metroid, part human. Um, yeah, it's, it's complicated. Um, but anyway, you know, like, the remaining X-Parasite taken from her is sent to a place called Biologic Space Labs, or BSL. Um, you know, great acronym. And after learning about an unexpected explosion at the site, Samus goes to investigate. And this all leads into the gameplay of Metroid Fusion. And, for what it's worth, Metroid Fusion, I really enjoy it, but... Metroid Fusion has been criticized as easily the most linear of the 2D Metroid games. Um, throughout most of the game, the player is guided through the game by a computer named Adam, who feels no pain in telling you exactly where to go, and d tell the player, you know, exactly what they must do. Through these, you know, regular exchanges at communication rooms that are, you know, littered through the game, exposition is given to the player at the cost of explorative autonomy. Um, you know, you simply just can't go to Sector 6 when they tell you to go to Sector 1. Or, like, there's a part in the game where the reactor in Sector 3 is overheating, so you have to go to Sector 3, and you're on, like, a countdown, and you can't go to Sector 4 or whatever, you know? And, you know, sometimes they're there because of, like, a mission, but other times they're just behind arbitrarily locked doors. You know, excluding small portions of the game that require certain power-ups to continue, as is characteristic for the Metroidvania genre, Metroid Fusion really relies on keeping areas out of the player's grasp, uh, simply to make sure that they hit all the story beats. And, you know, later, once you get near the end of the game, BSL does open up to you. Um, but again, it's not before you get to the very end of the game, when the final triumphant music starts playing and then you can finally play cleanup. And, uh, you know, then you can find all the shortcuts between routes, too. You can find the secret passage from Sector... I think it's Sector 2 to Sector 1, and Sector 6 to Sector 1, or whatever. This is all done in contrast to series darling Super Metroid, which, you know, has dedicated speedruns to completing the order of zones forwards, backwards, and even in random order. In contrast, Metroid Fusion only has one sequence-breaking option, and it's literally having to perform super precise shine sparks, and all it yields is a developer easter egg. It literally does not skip any of the game. And, you know, because of this linearity, I really hesitate to call Metroid Fusion a true Metroidvania game, you know? But, you know, I'm st I say you know a lot. Have you noticed that? You know this thing? Oh my god. I mean, despite the fact that I don't really consider it a true Metroidvania game, I still am able to find immense joy from playing it, you know? Like, 
I do it again. There it is. The crutch. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love the freedom to explore in Super Metroid, but like during my first playthrough, which you can actually watch on this channel, it's still not privated and it's 10 years old now. What the hell? Making Let's Plays on the family iMac in the sunroom with my headset. No, not even. I had just the earbuds in and I was recording with the in-computer microphone. Wow. What what a world we live in. Oh yeah. This game is probably the hardest one I have played considering it's blind. Metroid Blind is very, very hard. And I've already done Metroid. <sighs> but like I was getting lost a lot in that version. Uh, I was getting very lost on Planet Zebes. Zebes, Zebes, Zebes. I'm just gonna call it Zebes. 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 That's what we're going with. And I was getting lost a lot in like Norfair, at the wrecked ship, everywhere like that. I couldn't cross the noob bridge. But, you know, this is all in contrast to uh, my first playthrough of Fusion, where I never got lost once, and instead a lot of my... <laughs> A lot of my frustration came instead from all the combat and hard boss fights and trying to sort of outmaneuver the antagonist of the game, the SAX. Every 10-15 to 15 minute chunk of gameplay, as is characteristic of the Game Boy Advance, was spent cleaning up the mess that the SAX and other X-Parasites had made. You know, like finding the lost underwater specimen that had escaped its container or finding the source of the vines and snaring the power core of the facility. And even preventing a perfect copy of Ridley from escaping out to the galaxy. You know, perfect copy created by the X. He's not a clone. He's a perfect copy. It wasn't until these tasks and others had been completed that I, as the player, was given full freedom to explore the rest of BSL to my heart's content. But because of these segmentations in the game, I was never really frustrated by the portioned out level design in Metroid Fusion because of the bite-sized nature of the way I was playing it. It's a Game Boy Advance game, it's a mobile game, it's designed to be picked up and played for like 15 minutes and then when your mom tells you it's time for dinner, you tell her, okay I need to get to a save point, you get to a save point and then turn the game off. It's not like in Super where, you know, you could leave the console and TV on and just go there because, you know, it's powered by your power grid. You could plug in your Game Boy Advance, sure, but then you, you know, you run the risk of, uh, something going horribly wrong, and in Super Metroid, the save stations are convenient, but also really not. If I got called down for dinner, and I was playing Super Metroid, I would have a lot harder of a time trying to find a place to stop than what I would if I were playing Fusion. And I think that was kind of the goal. All of these parts of fusions, you can break up into clearly defined segments or arcs. Not to joke about how Sector 5 is literally titled arc, but all the same. You start off with going to Sector 1 and fixing all the power cooling things, and then you go to Sector 2 and oh no, you get trapped inside because the SAX blew something up. And then you move to Sector 4 because Ceres escapes and then Oh no, now you go to Sector 3 and because you, you have to unlock some doors, but when you unlock them, then X comes in and blocks your exit out. Or then you go to Sector 6 and you have to find some other things to find the various suits so you can go into Sector 5. It's very obvious, these chunks of gameplay and the way that fusion works. It always feels like you're on a defined path by the developers, and you're never going to really be lost. I enjoyed it. However, this enjoyment, unlike other Metroidvanias, doesn't really stem from the whole world explorative aspect in the way that with Super Metroid you get, or even Kirby in the Amazing Mirror. It's not a Kirby essay video, but God damn it, I love Kirby in the Amazing Mirror. The appeal of these two games, Super Metroid and Amazing Mirror, is derived far less from the complicated combat scenarios you face, and more from exploring the world. Especially with um, Super Metroid in particular, Super Metroid doesn't really have the greatest combat. And I know people are going to probably take offense to that when I insult Super Metroid, but 
really, Super Metroid, it's not that complicated. There aren't really any true chase scenes or countdowns until the end of the game, and most bosses can be just sitting and waiting and hitting them in their weak point, you know? I mean, look at Spore Spawn. Okay, that's low-hanging fruit. Crocomire. Crocomire, you're literally shooting missiles into his mouth when it opens and it's a game of tug of war. It's a creative concept, but really does not require much more than just shooting missiles into his mouth. Same thing goes for Kraid, where, you know, you have some platforming, but you really aren't doing anything other than shooting into his mouth and occasionally jumping. I think the only true exception to this is really Ridley, because you can just sort of unload and try to dodge attacks. But with bosses like Bot Woon, for example, you're literally waiting until Bot Woon comes out of the walls to shoot it. And this weak point, waiting for the weak point to open, isn't a bad thing. Super Metroid is not trying to be this crazy dance of duels and, you know, how are we gonna fight this guy? Oh my god, I have to learn all its attack patterns kind of thing, the way Fusion has. What with Yakuza or Natori, I think is it? No, Natori is the Japanese name for Ferrothorn. Whatever, whatever that Mother Brain-esque fight is in Sector 2. Or even, even the first boss in Metroid Fusion is a lot more complicated. It's uh, Arachnus, I think is his name. He's the guy who goes... <laughs> like that, that's what he sounds like. So, yeah, I mean, the fact that Super Metroid doesn't have the most complicated combat, even on an enemy-to-enemy -enemy level, isn't really a bad thing. It's just that the most memorable combat moments uh, in Super Metroid happen to be basically the final boss, and maybe Crocomire. But again, this combat simplicity isn't the worst thing in the world. Because the game is taking pride in the planet it has made, the, the rooms, you know, the rooms to go into, the intentionally crafted zones where sequence breaking is not only possible, but there by design. There's a great video that talks about how literally a good half of Meridia after the wrecked ship is literally just devoid of any power-ups so you can skip it. It's really cool. I don't remember the video. I think it's like a Mark Brown video or something. Probably. Mark Brown Super Metroid, something like that. But if only there were a happy medium between these two styles of game. One that lets you feel like you're exploring, but you're really not. Oh man. Only there were another Metroid game that could scratch that itch. Oh, if only. You know, I did get that though. Uh, that, that was what I was thinking to myself. Uh, June 14th, 2021. Trust me, I wrote about it. Little did I know that the next day I would get a trailer that would fix all of those problems. <laughs> when the game launched on October 3rd, 2021, I ended up beating it almost five months later. <laughs> um, you know, in that period of time, my first play period was on stream. You can watch the VOD on Voltage VODs. I'm using footage from it, quite frankly. Probably. I don't know. Future me, you better be doing that. Shut up, dickbag. And so, I played about three hours on stream, I got to the first Emmy encounter and shat my pants. And that was that. The last four play periods all took place on spring break, late February, early March 2022. And you might ask, oh, what were you doing all those other days? Well, the answer, in simple terms, was being tired out from grad school. But it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. I did, in fact, pass my quals. I am almost done with having homework for the rest of my life, mostly. I'm almost done with those weekends where I literally just do data analysis for a report. Wait, it doesn't end. Oh, God. <sighs> Why did I do this? Nah, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. I'd come home from grad school and be tired and... I'd, I'd say to myself at lunch that day, Wow, I'm, I'm feeling like playing s some, some Metroid Dread tonight. I'm really feeling it. And then I'd come home, and I'd be like, I don't feel like playing Metroid Dread today. I just, I don't want to deal with them because they're tired. And so I didn't play it. I, I remembered how tired out I was after that stream, 
And then I would just play something calmer instead, or work on homework. Whichever one seemed more, um, advantageous in that moment. It took me, like, five months to just sit down and tell myself, Hey, you're gonna play Super Metroid. No, you're not gonna play Super Metroid, you stupid idiot. You're gonna play Metroid Dread, because that's the new game. That's the new game that you have been waiting 19... Well, everyone's been waiting 19. You only started playing this one in 2012. But still, 10 years! You... Nine years. Nine years! You've been waiting nine years to play this game. And now you're just gonna say, Oh, I'm too tired. You know, I don't wanna play it. No. Give me a break. You're gonna play it. And so that's what I did. Something about that initial play session had really shaken me and stressed me out. You know? But I waited this long. It was not something that I just wanted to leave by the wayside. And so, at my parents' house, I slid my Switch into Mom's Animal Crossing Switch dock and booted the game up from Artaria where I had left off. Hilariously, I thought I was like, you know, I made a good chunk of progress. No, I, I, I made like no progress from that first play session. So, the big thing, when I booted it up, it was like, I have no idea what I was just doing. I think I beat that one Scorpius or whatever it is. Porpius. The, 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 dude, the dude who turns invisible. And I thought to myself, okay, I don't remember where I was going. But you know, the strange thing about Metroid Dread is that you always happen to end up right where you need to be. <laughs> the natural feeling exploration leads the player, in this case me, from one zone to another at a breakneck pace, and yet there was never really a moment where I ever felt like I was truly lost in the way that I did with Super Metroid. I wouldn't say that I never... I didn't quite always have my wits about me and my bearings all straightened out, but, you know, I, I never felt like I was in a spot where I shouldn't be. And that's good. I found myself, you know, really surprised that I had actually been going the correct direction all along, and, uh... I entered a room and it's it cut me off from going back and I realized, oh, I guess I'm going the right way. Huh. And with the power of hindsight, it's pretty clear that Mercury Steam, uh, when they were developing this, were very aware of the stressors that can impact players when playing Metroidvania games, such as the question, am I going the right way? And tedious little mindless things like backtracking and significant lack of meaningful resource recovery and obtuse map design. And they and they were very focused on these issues and took significant level design measures to minimize these stressors as much as possible. And I really like that! I like it a lot! Mercury Steam's primary means of pushing the player in the right direction comes from these previously mentioned one-way obstacles. These may be these small gaps that normally you'd be able to go through fine because you've got the morph ball, but no, obviously, you don't have the Morph Ball in this game. You only have a slide, and you don't get the Morph Ball until, like, you kill the first Emmy or something, basically. Or the one that actually matters. And those might appear when you decide, Oh, hey, look at that cool pulsating thing in the wall. I'm gonna shoot it. These things will just arbitrarily cut you off from going backwards. Another example of these one-way things might be a giant turnstile that grant access to a power-up, but in doing so, they prevent the player from returning the way they came. Or like this elevator thing in Gavorin, I still don't get how that fits into the whole planetary architecture or whatever, but what do I care? I'm just a freaking gamer. I'm not a game designer. I think this is actually, though, really ingenious for level design. And it works really well with giving the player a fleeting feeling of freedom, only to then sort of discover that there is only one path forward, and it's the path that they are on, and it's the most dangerous path available to. The realization that in order to make any progress, I have to enter an Emmy zone fills me with, uh-oh, here it comes. Here it comes! The namesake appropriate feeling! Dread! Why did I say it like that? Oh my god. I'm keeping it, though. And to that end, I give Mercury Steam a lot of credit in designing each zone with such design 
to both fill me with the comfort in knowing that I was on the right path, and also the discomfort in knowing that there was, in fact, no way else forward but this path. So I had to steal myself and go exactly down the path that they presented to me, giving me what I thought was free choice, but in reality is just like another, haha, you get to have an elevated heart rate for another 15-20 minutes. But, the, but I think the thing that really strikes me here is that the game was never telling me where to go or holding my hand in the way that Fusion did with Adam. I mean, while Adam was still here, <laughs> yeah, and he was talking about how cool Ravenbeak is. He was there, you know, to give me guidance uh, as a player, you know, how to keep going, but ultimately it was my job to figure out where I was going, what I was doing, and what my next objective was. And this is where I am so happy to say that the level design in Planet ZDR is also just, oh, so good. It's really nice in the way it just leaves little hints to the player going through their journey. As the player tries to get to the surface, there are plenty of little moments where you're like, oh, huh, that's interesting, wonder if that'll be useful later with another power-up. Only uh, to eventually find out that yes, it will be! One of my favorite examples of this sort of situation comes in the form of the screw attack and a specific set of blocks I found I was passing a lot in Gavorin on my travels. There's one part of the game um, where going through it naturally and not doing any sort of sequence breaking, where Samus will enter a very narrow hallway in Gavorin that has some minor obstacles that require bombs to pass through. But in bombing these blocks, the player is also shown the properties of the surrounding blocks. And in this case, those surrounding blocks have these blue S-shaped logos. And come on, if you've played a Metroid game like Fusion or Super, you'll know that these are in fact screw attack blocks that can be broken with your screw attack. You can't do anything with them for now, but they stay in your brain and you come back later. You go through this hallway a couple different times later when you get stuff like the space jump, but you still can't go through this pathway. That is, until you find the screw. And literally the screen beneath these ones leads to a teleportal. Which is oddly convenient, wouldn't you say? And wouldn't you know, you get the screw attack and the nearest teleportal is which one? This one. The one that goes to Gavorin where, wouldn't you know, you use the screw attack on these blocks. And even if that teleportal didn't take you there, it's likely that your first instinct upon getting the screw attack is thinking, oh, now I can break those blocks in Gavorin. Oh, how about that? Oh! Just works out really nicely. And it's thoroughly surprising and really insanely satisfying to finally be able to break those blocks only to discover that there is in fact just a boss like two screens later, and this was the whole right path to go in the first place. It wasn't like the game was hiding, you know, a cheeky energy tank behind this. No, this is the way forward through the game. I think that's really cool. I think that the level design in Dread has these little moments that are just awesome payoffs. And it's easily my favorite, favorite thing about the level design in this game. And there are other ways that Dread is able to deliver that rush of dopamine. It's combat encounters. The boss fights in Metroid Dread are so fun to play. They are tedious and stressful and very, very fun. And I know I just said tedious and fun in the same sentence and I'm now realizing that really that doesn't make any sense, but bear with me, it makes sense. You'll die a lot. I mean, that's just how it goes with this game. You will die plenty of times, because the boss fights in Metroid Dread range from tense to downright frantic, depending on the foe. I don't think I've played a game that throws the player into a chaotic string of combos whilst forcing them to slow down the fight as much as possible. I mean, I haven't played any of the Souls games, but that's probably it probably feels very similar to that, you know? Basically, though, you're just trying to figure out how you can beat these opponents. These opponents. Ugh. Some of these fights, like with the robotic Chozo soldiers, were sh really shocking, if only because they came literally out of nowhere. 
and I was just exploring a zone and then suddenly BAM! Room! Boss time! Ow! But honestly, once I figured out that these robotic Chozos have the most predictable boss fight patterns, attack patterns on the planet, it was incredibly easy to just pick out the nature of their attack pattern and then go. And as a result, these boss fights were never really that frustrating because by the fourth time it comes around, it's like, oh, I know how to beat you. You're easy now. It feels like I've gotten stronger by fighting these guys. And I really like that. Even when I was facing two at the same time, it was just a matter of juggling their attack patterns. And I thought that that was really cool. It never got obscenely hard because it was easy to figure out their moves. And then there were other fights that were actually a lot harder, like with Kraid or the experiment, that posed significantly more interesting and complicated challenges while remaining very complete and very satisfying. The encounter with Kraid and Catarus harkens back to those fights in both Super Metroid and Metroid Zero Mission, and it really just felt so cool to see that those tactics still sort of worked, but had a new spin on them. I, I really, really enjoyed that I could take my previous encounters with Kraid and still apply them almost two decades later. The fight with the experiment, on the other hand, was a satisfying test of skill near the end of the game and really forced me to prove that I knew how I could move around in the game and that I knew how to use all of my attacks, that I knew how to use the Shine Spark, and while I didn't kill the experiment with the Shine Spark, I think it's really cool that it is a one-hit kill. So, it's incredibly cinematic, both of these fights actually, Kraid and the experiment. Um, there's just a ton of really cool fight choreography and the um, cutscenes in the fight upon landing a counter, which I also found was a welcome and motivating force to keep fighting even when I inevitably died multiple times because I failed to dodge that one projectile. These fights, when compared to bosses like Yakuza and Nightmare from Fusion, feel like the natural progression, especially because it now has that counter mechanic from Metroid uh, Samus Returns, which, yeah, that's that's the name of the 3DS one Mercury Steam made. Works great in this one. Didn't really work on the 3DS because the buttons kind of hurt. <laughs> but it feels like the natural progression of combat in this franchise as they force the player to use more complex movements and attacks that might not be as simple as haphazardly firing missiles into the boss's toothy maw. When I was able to finally take down bosses like these two, Kraid and the Experiment, for example, I got that rush of happiness and elation knowing that I could progress, and that each alien mess was no match for my epic skills. I'd say basically, the best way to put it is that the bosses in Metroid Dread strictly adhere to the hard but fair adage, as it is very easy to learn the appropriate measures to counter each foe, but not without trial and error. It does feel a little Super Meat Boy-esque, and I do feel at times that um, there are some bosses that are very silly sometimes, but or hard to figure out, but for the most part, fighting all of these bosses was, you know, a genuine joy. The only time it was really cheap or unfair uh, was one boss in Ferenia, but even then, that was a really cool experience. And I felt it was only cheap because I wasn't paying attention to the overarching narrative of the Metroid franchise. What do I mean by that? Well, I'll tell you. Basically, in Ferenia, there's this boss named SQ. It comes after you've done a couple things in the game, but SQ, you fight it, you beat it, and then you get this sort of moment where you feel like you beat the game. But then BAM, SQ's got a second form, and you're like, what the hell? I didn't see that coming, what the, what the hell? But for me, that second form was, the progression of it was basically like, what the hell? Oh, damn it, I thought I'd kill it, shit! Oh, shit, oh, I know that, oh, that's so cool. Oh, I love that. It basically threw me for a loop, but that disdain very quickly morphed into a feeling of satisfaction and a pleasant surprise. And it's, it's, it's really cool for me as someone who plays Fusion a lot that it's one of my favorite games 
But in order to explain this, I need to add some context. And I do need to spoil one of the biggest twists in the game. So, here's your spoiler warning. Woo -woo -woo -woo. So about two-thirds of the way through the game, Samus enters a sealed quarantine structure known as Elon. It is here that Samus first encounters monsters that are the hosts of the X-Parasite. What? In this game? No. What? Oh, man. And really, get this, upon killing them, Samus is literally able to recover HP by, get this, touching those X-Parasite blobs. And the green ones also restore missiles, which still doesn't make any sense, but still. They work the exact same way they did in Fusion. That's so cool. That's so cool. That's so fucking cool to me. When you kill a monster and the X Parasite works the way it does in Fusion, it was so, so cool. Because I had gotten used to the whole basic purple energy spheres and little red turret shaped objects being the basic means of recovery. And when suddenly out of nowhere, oh, Metroid Fusion mechanics again, it was so freaking cool, dude. And when Samus eventually does the unthinkable and unleashes literally every single X-Parasite onto Planet ZDR, every single enemy now adapts to this new X-Parasite combat system. Foes will respond if the X-Parasite is not gathered quickly enough and morph into significantly tougher creatures. It's also really cool because this changes the way the game is played like halfway through the game, more than halfway through the game. And I was absolutely gobsmacked by this, because not only was this a fundamental change to how enemies worked, but it was also just really, really nice and cool to see the mechanics return to that of a previous game, that of Fusion, the literal previous game in the whole timeline it logically makes sense for this to be the mechanics. And that's so cool. So, bringing this back to SQ then, when I took out its first form, and its second form turned into an X blob from how you fight them at the end of bosses in Fusion, I was blown away. I mean, in defeating this disgusting bug, I subconsciously paused, and was caught completely off guard by the sudden transformation. And I, I will be honest, I was really frustrated at this not being telegraphed. I had no idea this was coming, but then I realized, no, of course there would be a second form. That's how it worked in Fusion. That's, 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 that's just how it worked. I literally set my controller down and pulled a Leo meme from uh, that one fucking Tarantino movie. It was like, oh, whoa, you know, and, and then, and then I died, and then I died, and I had to fight the boss again. And admittedly, to someone who's never played Fusion, this might come across as a cheap trick or something. But as someone who has played Fusion, this was the game telling me like, Hey, don't get slacking, okay? The game works like Fusion now. Oh, you got caught off guard and died? Oh, that's your fault. You've played Fusion. You should know. The sudden death was well appreciated and completely fair, in my opinion. And that's just how it was. So it was my own fault for not remembering the second phase. That's all. In my next encounter with SQ, I would make sure that I prepared my storm missiles for the second phase as well as the first. And as expected, I appropriately kicked its ass. <sighs> but as with all things in life, however, there are no things that are truly perfect. Metroid Dread is no exception. One of my biggest gripes about Dread stems from its underwater movement. And literally, this is the one part that made me pause in replaying Fu uh, Dread, excuse me, not Fusion, Dread, a second time immediately after beating it the first time. It's so slow. It's so frustrating especially when you're trying to figure out the right way to go. There's this stretch of rooms in Burenia where the player, right before the player obtains the gravity suit, and it starts off where you fall through the giant room and end up truly at the bottom. You know, you are on 
the bottom of the seafloor. You can tell there's the giant whale thing where if you walk underneath it, it emits the purple energy and hurts you. And the music is replaced by some slight droning and some sonar blips that become more and more distorted the more Samur... Samur. The more Samus goes deeper into the zone. And I I like that, you know, I like I like the aesthetic. I think it's really cool. I like this. I think that these rooms are really aesthetically consistent. They are well designed and they make you feel like you are truly at the bottom of the ocean. However, that is also a problem because <laughs> It's sluggish and submerged, and there is just one giant room that just requires continuous space jumps, and if you fuck up, then you have to go to the bottom and go to another screen where the droning is slightly less loud, so then when you go back into the next room, the room where you have to do all the space jumps again, the droning is really loud, and the sonar blips are more distorted, and it's like the signal is not traveling through water the same way that Samus is not jumping across the fucking room! Okay. It got to me. That That is when it got to me. I was fucking tired of it. Because you get to the top of the room, you shoot this one blob thing, and like the cap at the top gets dislodged, but then it's not clear where the next one is. And so you have to shoot it again with another charge beam, but I didn't see it, so I thought I had to make this really precise jump. And that's not how you're supposed to clear that room. And I spent the better part of a half hour just going through this room trying to figure out where the hell I was supposed to go next and it is the only part of the game that I looked up a walkthrough for. It was madness inducing. The droning music, the blips, the fruitless attempts to clear the room, the fact that I kept falling to the bottom of the fucking room all the time! I had to take a break after figuring it out. I got the gravity suit and then I set the game down and I, I uh, took a break. I went for a run. It was very nice. This is literally the only part of the game that this happened, though. This is the only part of the game where I sat down and said to myself, okay, I need to fucking pause. I need to do something else. And I was really frustrated that I didn't figure out the puzzle sooner, but once I figured it out, it was back to the fun part of the adventure because suddenly the gravity suit makes it so that the water is not a fucking travesty of gameplay. Luckily for me, Literally, the next room is the room that had the gravity suit. <laughs> so it all worked out in the end. And, you know, there there were some other things. I felt like Mr. Jaffe for a moment where initially I thought I was soft-locked. And, uh-oh, where do I go? What do I do? The game's led me to this room, but there's no clear way forward. And I hadn't gotten back into the mode of clicking my buttons and shooting everything. Which is fine, it's fine. I figured it out eventually, I'm not a game journalist. The merit of the game's maze design ensured that I hit a dead end, I would still be able to keep going. I mean, that's just how it worked. The path couldn't be too far away, right? But again, I can point to at least three different times, including the previously noted deep room in Burenia, where I spent more time than I would care to admit attempting to find that one breakable block in order to properly progress. Again, this issue would be uh, a lot more problematic to me if the game had lacked the carefully designed, subconsciously guiding level design. Uh, if this happened in Super Metroid, I would probably lose it when I was first playing it. Uh, but the thing is, it was clear that I was always at least somewhat on the right track, so these moments hardly detracted from my experience. Despite these small, nitpicky moments, I've really come away from Metroid Dread with the feeling of a long-awaited satisfaction, and the joy of having a new game enter my circle of games I will write over 3,000 words about and talk about on a YouTube channel. The masterful melding of the Metroidvania-style exploration from Super and the complicated battles from Fusion is what makes Metroid Dread one of my favorite games on the Switch, and arguably one of my favorite games ever. While I have yet to replay this game, I will. I, I fully plan to. And Dread's ability to take my favorite aspects from my two other favorite 2D Metroid games and so carefully weave them together is what does it for me. 
after 19 years. It's so incredibly satisfying. Can I really say 19 years? No. 19 years since Metroid Fusion, 12 years since first playing Fusion for myself, I can finally say that it's so, so satisfying to see this game finally exist and be really, really good. I think to Duke Nukem Forever and how people were anticipating that game for so long and then it turned out to be a crock of shit. I have full faith in, in Mercury Steam to make a Metroid 6. I don't know if it'll happen, but goddamn, Metroid Dread rocks. I I give this game a ha ha, just, just what, what I, I needed. needed out of 10. Play this game, please. Please, please, please play this game. You know, now it's like, it's no yeah, because where, where does the story go from there? This is the end of yeah, Samus Aran's storyline. I'm kind of sad because I want to see like the story go places. Yeah, I but think. But I also realize there's not a whole lot to go after this. Just Metroid Dread. Dread. Well, yeah, there was Metroid Five that was being developed for the DS. I think that like got canceled or something. Aww. Like it was in development hell for a while. Yeah.